in reactive programming. Not even your hand? No. <laughs> okay. No, I, I mean, I actually sat at, uh, in the, so the closest I can say to being an, an expert at reactive programming is that I sat with uh, Jamar, uh, who's like one of the Netflix JavaScript reactive gurus in, uh, in New York for, uh, you know, about an hour. So, um, <coughs> which was, you know, quite interesting, except for uh, I was trying to do something and he um, and I were just not able to successfully actually uh, get it done using uh, well this I mean so this whole reactive thing I, I don't know how it got formalized because it sort of like came from they had like a reactive uh, conference in London and there was a couple number of very interesting people there um, so do, does anyone know the principles of reactive no you started from ground zero yes from <laughs> <laughs> oh great glad I prepared for, uh, for a talk then um, right, no, uh, uh, it, to me the two biggest uh, um, things are uh, event-based message-driven, right? And there's a couple of other things about durability and stuff like that, right? But mostly event-based uh, and, 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 and message-driven, uh, uh, some message passing is, is at the core of the, uh, of the architecture. And, and, and strangely enough, I actually do have some expertise in, in, in this type of system because we actually built a system that was message-based and, um, <coughs> and uh, event-driven in, uh, well, we started in about 1992 when we designed it. It took, you know, a, well, it was an ongoing project for a number of years, right? Um, and it was completely durable uh, because of the way that we designed it to do. Um, first off, uh, the all the queues were disk based that means that machines could go up and down, not a problem because you know everything is durable that way. And even if we had some long-running programs that had large chunks of processing to do, uh, you know we had one process that ran 50 hours to failure. Um, so if, if the machine went down in the middle of that, of course you wanted to be able to recover gracefully. And so there was like checkpointing and stuff like that going on inside there that made it, uh, you know, a fairly robust system. Everything was highly distributed, no single point of failure. In other words, uh, there was customized processing plans for each chunk of data that would follow the data around the system. You know, so it didn't have to go back someplace to say, okay, what do I do next? It just the workflows were all defined and, and traveling with the work, shall we say. Um, so it was an interesting system, uh, very highly scalable because you know it basically it scaled out to as many machines as we could fit in our in our farm. Um, yeah, and back then, you know. <clears throat> with no virtualization, I mean, or anything, it was, it was basically off the truck into the <laughs> into the data center type thing. Um, uh, and, and those seem to be the uh, you know, the the two principles that I've that I've always found in highly scalable systems: uh, event-based, message-driven, right? And I think even Erlang works that way. Has anyone looked yeah. at Erlang? Yeah. You? Well, I, I've done little sample projects in it, but I uh, used to be a functional version geek. Right, okay, so, yeah, if, so I, I, you, then you've done more of, of Erlang actually is using actor-based uh, systems. That is the main point of Erlang, writing actors. Yeah, so then you get into the actor-based uh, yeah. frames of that, uh, that support it. Um, but, it, yeah, and, and with the, uh, you know, the, the big push, well, first off, the, I mean, the first <coughs> reactive library, I guess, comes from C Sharp, Microsoft, which gets ported into JavaScript, and now it was ported into RxJava, uh, which is um, <coughs> built by Netflix. Yeah. Does anyone know about Netflix? Mm -hmm. Well, you, I mean, you watch the movies, right? And right. stuff like that. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, that's what I know about. But uh, <laughs> that's what you know about. It. So, so the, their architecture is actually quite interesting. You know, actually, the whole company is quite interesting how they operate. Um, I, I guess you've had some exposure to yeah, them too. Yeah, I, I know a bunch of the guys on the operation side there. On the operation side. Well, uh, the, the DevOps side. Yeah, DevOps. They actually have DevOps. <laughs> the way they run, I didn't think they really had needed much of a big DevOps. The DevOps team. Yeah, so we know a bunch of guys in there that uh, explain it. But essentially, um, their whole system is reactive uh, from the from the get go. And um, and it's it's 
you know, everything is to be resilient. Uh, uh, what's the name of that silly process they run? It's like uh, the, the monkey. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Monkey. Chaos monkey? Chaos monkey, yes, yeah. right. Yeah, so that's, that supports their policy of, of killing, um, was it, I think it was like, they said 30% of their processes in their production system while they're live running. So anything you write or deploy there has to be able to survive Chaos Monkey and not affect any customer experience. Yeah, so, so Chaos Monkey is essentially a framework that randomly kills or sec-folds sec JVMs and then kind of things. So they, they try to, they came up with this, with, with Chaos Monkey to prove that their software is actually absolutely fault tolerant in any kind of, of situation. Yeah, oh, and they, they proved it by <coughs> accidentally running it in production. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But they no, that's not accidental. Well, <laughs> it, it wasn't was. in the first place. It wasn't yeah, in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, it didn't cause any problems, which is good. Right. They proved that they were actually doing the right stuff in their cloud deployments. But right. But and they also have a very uh, uh, controlled deployment <coughs> process where they'll deploy across time zones when. Uh, uh, oh, and by the way, if you want to your laptop, they have a ready now to copy those. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, how far yeah, away can I be? Yeah. The ports over there. Right? Oh. Yeah, I can dig up my Mac adapter, or I can use this one that's been kindly handed to me. Let's see, take the harder route, right? So I have a bit of code here, but it didn't work uh, for some reason. So, um, the so mics on that table, I would be careful about. Um, yeah. Oops. Well, just I'm just about in front of no, oh yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's not lit, so it's not working. <coughs> It's not working. <coughs> so, I was, I was expecting some people would show up and say, has anyone sort of written systems that are, have been involved with systems that are like the message base? Message based systems? I worked on a staged event driven processing system for, um, I forget what the business reason was, but it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> You forget with the business. Uh, yeah, the, the marketing guys, the sales guys have to deal with that. We just wanted to build cool hardware. Oh, okay. Software. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Actually, I actually built an event driven, oh, uh, I have built an event driven uh, game server architecture. Do you explain? No. Yeah? <laughs> event driven. Um, yeah, so uh, the reason why, you know, it was interesting to me is because, like, you know, um, so I wrote Sensum, which is a garbage collection analysis tooling, and, uh, and internally, it was a traditional, you get a file, you parse it, you create something into a data structure, and you run queries over the data structure that will get, um, um, oh, nice, uh, that will get uh, pushed into, you know, you're going to see my it's messy awesome. desktop. Yeah, I really like the software. What's that? I'm uh, loading the software. Not the one that you were talking about. Yeah, <laughs> let me just, uh, actually I was doing all kinds of stuff this morning so it wasn't really, and the Heinz trapped me for something so I was like, oops, mail. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't worry, people just pause for him to roll your email, but it's okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually all they're going to read is that that was actually all my, my tax information from Hungary, actually. Yeah, oh, that is pretty interesting. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to see tax information yeah. from Hungary? I didn't think so. Skype uh, Skype out. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much enough. Kill uh, yeah, kill. Oh, oh, that's the fun session we had on the uh, beach yesterday. Yeah. So I can, I think I can kill out. We're not actually going. Actually, where am I going? Let's go to just, just, <laughs> just go directly there instead of killing all these stupid windows there. Okay, so let's see if we can find this. Um. Maybe I'm in, in my sandbox, so let's see what's going on here. I'm not sure what you said there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> she won't understand you. It's my girlfriend I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That I means you're so. really geek. That's where he's like really cute. <laughs> <laughs> like so what uh, software are you using here? Demos. Yeah, this is um, Wirecast. A bunch of demos in here. So, okay. Oh, okay. There you the go. The only user-friendly broadcast software to help. No, that's FX. Is there a splitter in it? Uh, man, I should have been a little bit. Um, oh, those are really are uh, some 
demo type things. There's just a hacking way on. And Yeah, Jeff, show us some Samsung uh, source code. That's fine. Some sense some source code. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I could probably do that. Um, <laughs> but uh, well, actually, okay. So here's the problem, right? So so I looked at the framework. I, I looked at Akka, and I looked at um, uh, at, at the Arx uh, Java uh, frameworks, and um, um, they're really I found them to be uh, not very reachable. Uh, for normal programmers, right? Because mostly what they ha what they event is they'll get event streams and then they'll do transformations across event streams, which all sounds like really easy to do, um, but unfortunately the uh, the uh, the reality or the details really come into to bite uh, really hard. So after working in uh, with uh, Jamal, the uh, basically uh, RX expert in um, in uh, from Netflix, we weren't able to achieve what I was hoping that we would be able to achieve. And that should not be in demos. Sorry, I should have found this before, except for Heinz was um, kind of chatty, and I didn't pay attention to him. Uh, I can't find it. Okay. Um, let's just go into send some parent, parent stuff like that, so uh, kill that debug session. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if looking at source code is going to be interesting here. Let me go back to another thing. So what? So what I actually ended up doing was saying, like, okay, um, let's try it this way. Well, um, you know, the ACA framework is interesting. It's highly tuned. It, it goes really fast, but it's really, really, really heavyweight, and you, you carry a lot of baggage with you, right? And I wanted to use this in Sensum, so I didn't really want to use ACA because first off, I didn't need that power, right? I'm just, it's a log parser, you know, not a some millisecond or nanosecond transactional engine or something like that. Uh, and, uh, you know, Rx sort of seemed to come with a lot of baggage from C Sharp or, um, you know, uh, uh, from JavaScript, which made it uh, very difficult to use. So I just said, you know, I really want to do something really simple. Uh, what I want to do is I basically want to drive events through a system. So I want to take a basically a, a data source and turn it into an event stream and then and then just drive it through and then you know so so really we just came up with this uh, small little framework that um, <coughs> very small little framework that basically gives me I think reasonable separation concerns uh, reasonable um, mm, uh, robustness um, but I will not claim anything about performance in other words I didn't have any performance requirements so I didn't really actually uh, decide to come up with any, uh, you, know, you know, to make it like super fast or whatever like that. So, um, I don't know if you can see that. We yeah. This in? Yeah. So that's basically the interface that you have to implement. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Like I said, pretty simple. Um, and actually, you know, so that's our sync point. So that's basically, you know, something you want. If you want to declare your own events on this thing here, it's just basically, here's some events. And it just seems to be like a, a fairly, um, you know, this gets a little more, a uh, little more code in here, which is uh, basically like this is now in a pump. So this is like, the, that's sort of the engine that's, that's, uh, that's driving everything. And um, yeah, so we're taking from source and then just basically driving to sync, okay? Now, um, the, the, the thing with this is that I'm actually using what's known as guard threads here. So the pump actually doesn't do the pumping itself. All it does is manages a number of guard threads. So but that means that if a consumer um, of any of the events um, actually uh, decides to throw an ex uncaught exception, basically kill the thread, then um, it's not gonna affect the pump itself. The pump will keep functioning. And, and you know, there's more work that can be done around here to basically say if you kill a guard thread, then we can start another guard thread to you know, continue on uh, uh, doing the work and stuff like that. So there's a little bit of safety in here. Um, and of course, you're calling, defining a, a couple of things. But anyways, let's, let's just take a look at this. So this, this is my answer to the complexity that I found in the uh, Rx Java framework. 
Um, in this case here, what I have is a, an event source. Um, oh, no, there's a couple of different sources. So I have an event source, um, which is, um, uh, where is my event source in here? Uh, let's get in here. I have an event source anyways, and, um, and, and, and yeah, so there's my new data source right there, so we can look at it. So it's just a, a dummy one for tests, which just generates a whole bunch of uh, numbers and stuff like that. And so it streamlines them into um, an event stream, and then basically to untangle it on, on the way out, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to register as sync points these uh, things called queries. So it's an event pump query. Uh, so here's a double sum query, for instance. It's just a simple thing just to, you know, to, uh, just to flush things out, right? So it just sums doubles. But I also here register um, um, an integer sum query. So if the event coming through happens to be an integer, then the double query is going to ignore it, and the, inter and the uh, integer query here is going to pick it up, right? So it's just, it's just like a very simple thing, right? And so you end up with, um, uh, you know, um, let's look at the long sum, or sorry, double sum query. Right? No, that's it, sorry. Um, the integer event, right, and, um, and, and uh, sort of like the uh, uh, double event. So these are the events that will be generated by, this, uh, by, the, by, the, uh, by the stream. So, um, so you can see what happens is that they go through the stream and then uh, we'll go through uh, like a double dispatch and, and that will give you basically your downcast from the event into the appropriate event, which means that the appropriate query will pick up the appropriate events. And that's pretty much all I wanted to do. So if you, if you actually look at, you know, Sensum is a bigger code base, so if we actually like convert that into Sensum, um, oh, hold on, that's over here. What we did is in here. Sorry. Uh, 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 that should be enough. Um, we just come up with this like complete event hierarchy, right? Um, and so this is like, a, again, a generational GC event. Uh, it's a GC event. Let's go to here. And I think from here we have a JVM event. So I think from here I can actually get into uh, diagram show. Oops. I can actually go down as far as I want. Okay. So anyways, that's my pump event. Here's my JVM event. Um, and... Let's uh, go back on here. Um, we have like a par new event, and oops. <laughs> my par new event or whatever like that. And you, and you can see basically what I'm doing. I'm starting to build a hierarchy of all of these different events and stuff like that. And, and so uh, what happens is that now the parser itself becomes the data source. Things become event driven. And, and now um, what it means is that I can set my queries up to basically look for different events that are coming from the par the, in this case the data source is the parser. And, and you can define like transformations on those events, like whatever it is that you need to actually do to, 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 to get the work done. Um, the, the interesting thing about this piece of work is that Oracle for years now has been wanting to build a, a parser to parse the GC logs and give it to people. And they've never done it. Um, no comment. Um, <laughs> yeah, no comment. Um, you know, for one reason or another, you know, they just never resourced it for wh whatever reason. And, and I, the biggest part of the problem is that we couldn't actually um, come to terms with what the output of the parser would actually look like. So, in, in, so what I wanted to do with this was actually say, okay, um, you know, 
the output of the parser is actually going to be GC events. And the GC events are simply going to contain the data around what these GC events actually did to the system, period. We're done. Now, you know, so how do you get these events? Well, um, if you actually look into um, some of the queries here, uh, let's see if we can get into... one here. So it's a yeah, okay. So basically um, these are basically all events that are available to you, right? So if you have a if you wanted to find a filter on the system to get events, basically implement this and I'm just gonna over well basically override the events that I want to get. And the whole system now will actually you know, once you register that with the pump as a sync point, then uh, then uh, then you're going to you know basically receive the events, and you can do with with them whatever you want. And uh, so I think this now I think is uh, you know basically the parser that we wanted from Oracle, right? So uh, this is an example of turning this into uh, um, a pull-based system into an event-driven push-based system with uh, where we have these messages being passed up through the system. Um, Why do you need such a complex logic for a GC login logic? Why do you need complex logic for a GC login yeah, so logic? In my view, this is a theories VM, it's running, it's doing some GC work, GC events are being logged, probably sequentially because it's all linearized in terms of time. Right. And then you want to plot, maybe you want to have that real-time data, maybe you want to have seed risk respectively, but you want to plot that data and filter it according to whatever, you know, you all want to see, what you know, GC pauses, allocation rates, uh, whatever you want. Okay. Why do you need a, a re retroactive uh, paradigm to implement that? What What is the possible point of failure or, or, or maybe are you just using this as an example? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm well, I'm using this as an example right now, right? But do you see, do you see that blue thing that I highlighted? Yeah. Okay. Do you know what that is? Uh, yeah. It's uh, it's aging bit for uh, for particular. It, it's no, how many the whole objects? blue bit. The whole blue bit. Well, that's the status of scavenging through live objects. Okay. Yeah. It's um, it's marking. It's 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 increasing age bits on. Objects that survive uh, a garbage collection, probably young, young, young garbage collection. That's a concurrent mode failure. Okay, and that's one of the uh, more than twenty different ways you can get a representation for a concurrent mode failure. The representation of concurrent mode <coughs> failure changes with each, well, it can change with each different build of the JVM. Okay, so we're supporting logs from the one six. The one seven, the one eight, so we have to deal with all of these uh, different, uh, you know, uh, shall we say, trivialized changes in format, in order to pull the information out of here and actually get this deeper semantic meaning of the information, right? Because, uh, you know, we can look at that log record and say, oh yeah, okay, that's a concurrent mode failure because, you know, okay, hold on, it's a full GC with par new, with a concurrent mode failure, you know, record in there. So, you know, so, okay, so which concurrent uh, cycle were you, were you actually interrupting? Or were you interrupting a concurrent cycle? So right? what you actually do or is... Or is this a cause to a system GC? In this case, you're looking at the same, like, okay, with this particular format, uh, somebody's actually put on a, a scavenge before uh, full flag that's, uh, that's been set there because that's the only way you can get that type of record. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I, you know, by... Doing it this way, I can actually uh, understanding it this way. I can get deeper semantic meaning about what this actually represents in the runtime. Okay, which means I can do higher order analytics on this particular log than just say, oh, you know, that's a breakdown of, of, of age data and you know what was in heat before and after and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. So now now we're getting uh, deeper to, or closer to the reason as to why did the JVM call for this and what can we do to prevent this thing from occurring in, in the future, right? So, 
So, but anyways, that's, that, that's one thing. The other point is that I wanted to separate the parsing away from the analytics because of the variation in the log formats and the, and the arbitrary changes that occur um, in the log formats uh, over time, you know, so, um, and sometimes very quickly, and the bugs that accumulate in there and all of the other corruptions that happen. As you can see, this is actually even a corrupted, uh, well, actually this one is corrupted. Um, I can probably find it, I can probably quickly, not so quickly, but I can find the other examples where, where you have uh, corrupted records and so we want to, again, untangle the corruption so we can get deeper semantic meaning and stuff like that. So the, the, there is a complex analytic model on top of that that we want to separate from the parser. So you're normalizing the data. So we're normalizing the data in the parser and, uh, and then generating all of these like normal events that, the anal that makes it easier to do the analytics. Plus we can adapt the parsers uh, to um, changes in the log file. Uh, without having to worry about their effects on destabilizing any of the, the analytics or the queries. Yeah? Plus, uh, tool support from the development. Right. Uh, well, in, in this case here, the, the other thing is that to change from reactive, like, okay, so Sensum works now, it basically, well, it's half reactive in the sense that I've changed the, the bottom part to be reactive. So it reads a file and turns it into an event stream and then I do this we do the same brain dead thing we put up a progress bar well it does all these calculations right mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> now you know so uh, as, as soon as I finish dealing with the, uh, the you know stabilizing the parser here after making it reactive the next thing to do is just get rid of the progress bar let's start plotting data as it shows up as soon as we've done that now we can come back to the back and say, okay, now let's start supporting different data sources, not just a file. And so now we can have data streaming through the system, and the whole system is just moving in this direction as opposed to like, you know, yanking it up or pushing it through. You know, um, this the parser here is also um, uh, uh, multi-threaded. Okay, um, so um, you know, and the and the reason for multi threading the parser uh, actually wasn't performance. All of these design decisions were not made for the purpose of performance. They were made for the purpose of um, separation of concerns and, and uh, robustness, right? So, um, you know, if the, the fact that it, if it happens to perform, it's going to perform or not perform based <coughs> on um, other, other factors, not the fact that we decided to multi-thread or not. So and anyways, that's um, it, that's a little bit of you know how we used um, you know turn this into a reactive model, um, and as I you know I was hoping someone here would come up with if they would have would have had their own experiences with reactive models so that we have a deeper discussion than just my own experiences. But uh, sorry to say, no. But. And does it make more sense to you, though? Like, why we did it that way? Uh, yes, yeah, it, it sort of makes more sense, uh, indeed. Um, it's 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 a it's an interesting design way um, to do that because you don't you typically don't think of log parsing this way. You, you actually think of, and particularly when it comes to C events, you think of them as linear in terms of time. Uh, so you know, this event happened on this millisecond. This, and, you know, although there are concurrent GC threads. Uh, they they typically produce uh, you know filtered in timeline uh, GC events. And that's how you look at right. Things. So so in this case here to actually <coughs> deal with the concurrent event, right? What I do what I do is I start uh, stacking uh, as soon as the current current event starts. I start stacking all of the other events until the concurrent event finishes, and then then I'll drain the stack. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that allows you to actually record the concurrent event um, <coughs> uh, in time order when it started and when it occurred, so you can do the uh, so it keeps the proper time order and stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? So that's a, uh, but you know, again, you know, the analytic model doesn't really care about that because it is getting a time order stream of uh, GC events that it can actually um, interrogate or transform, right? Just out of curiosity, you, since we're talking on this topic, uh, you have seen another GC log analyzer that that a little company does. Azul. Uh, yeah, right. Yes. Uh, so is that kind of closer, closer functionality, or yeah, yeah, 
you know, you want to do build in more analytics uh, because in our case we usually you know, this data plot and now you think what happened here. <laughs> okay, so I can I consider memory a scarce resource. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, I also consider it something that um, people subscribe to and unsubscribe to. So you have subscription rates and unsubscription uh, subscription rates to memory. Um, and um, based on that thinking, I can now bring in um, some uh, resource uh, allocation, uh, monitoring, um, economic th stuff theories that can help me do higher order analytics on the data. Um, so for live streaming from uh, you know from a from a, a live running JVM. Um, the, the analytic that we're looking for is the one that's going to uh, be predictive as to, um, you know, telling ops that they're going to, they are approaching critical memory condition. When you talk about analytics, it's, uh, you're not you're talking about machine learning models. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. I think talking more specifically about, sure. in this case, it would uh, ultimately just be extrapolating the graph. Um, no, because extrapolating the graphs in these cases, where it, uh, you know, quite simply doesn't work. Um, let me see if I can. So, show what would the input vectors be for your uh, machine learning algorithms? Then, obviously, one would be time. The other would be uh, the uh, velocity of allocation <coughs> on the deep step. Or uh, what would the uh, input vectors be? The, the okay. So uh, the honest answer is I don't know yet because uh, we've just started preliminary work on on that type of thing. Uh, but uh, my feeling is it's going to be pretty much what I look for when I. Uh, when I start uh, uh, doing uh, like uh, doing my own analysis, right. and um, that's going to be uh, you know frequency and, and recovery rates and stuff like that. So there's like if I look at um, so you sure that there's correlation between the points and the vectors. In other words, you can make predictions based on that. yeah, and they won't always be right. Uh, no, of course. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it's a probability. Yeah, it's a it's a probability yes. and stuff like that. So. Um, uh, let's uh, let's let's see if I can get to. Uh, problem is I'm not very organized at um, keeping. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and what's this type of uh, architecture ultimately you can stream the VM data to remote machines and then analyze networks uh, rather than single VMs? Yes. Course, right? Yes. And that, that would be it. And then react and allocate resources based on the predictive model from the networks. That's correct. Yeah, so there's there's, the there's all kinds of downstream work that yeah. can actually come from that 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 that, that becomes uh, predictive. Okay, I think let's try this one here. Well, that's a nice progress bar. Okay, so oh yeah, <laughs> so this is this is one I actually got from Heinz. Oops, did I kill that? No, where'd it go to? Oh, there. Where'd it go? That's the Java window. <laughs> you may have minimized that somewhere. I didn't minimize it. It's down here. Well, I guess you can kill it and start all over. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. <laughs> that was weird. Okay, so let's take a look. Some. So this is a this is an application that Heinz, or a benchmark Heinz is working on, right? So um, you know, and there's a you minimize this. Oh, oh it's, it's it's down below. <laughs> I didn't minimize. Oh, it, yeah, it, no, 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 no. I, I said make it this the full yeah, screen right. size, but it's confused by the uh, yeah. by Stephen's stuff, I guess. So let me try hitting the green again. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to leave it that size there. Okay, so this is something that Heinz was doing just to do a benchmark on on some fun things and everything like that. And and for me, um, you know, uh, uh, in this one here, I, I, you, of course, it's only one use case and stuff like that, but. There's a couple of interesting signs that uh, say that you know you're you're basically running into into trouble very quickly, and that has to do with the frequency of full GCs here. Yeah, so the red things are full GCs, the blue things are are scavenges, and so it's all parallel collector and stuff like that. Um, and so if you if you if you look at this graph, you can see um, that the frequency of full GC is interesting, but the underlying trend, the interesting trend, is this that that. That, that. So the lower pixels. These are the interesting guys. So we actually, this is our, shall we say, brain dead preliminary analytic on that. And that's what our brain dead preliminary analytic says on that. 
Okay, so this one obviously isn't good enough, right? So that, that, that to me that says there is no memory leak in this application, right? So I can do an R squared correlation on this thing afterwards and uh, and and, uh, and and say okay, no no memory leak, but you know, but that's absolutely correct, okay? Because the underlying trend is this. How do you know that that is the trend? You just look at a uh, a low low order function. You try to interpolate over low low order with low order function over 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 pixels, and and, and this way. You kind of guess what is the... No, I don't, I'm, just gonna, I'm, I'm filtering for these events. So, like, any for this particular analytic, like, anything up here is noise. So it's really all about filtering noise. Mm -hmm. Okay? No, why, I'm just wondering, why did you select the lower uh, points? Because that's, <coughs> my, that's, my, that's my trend. So you, you're, just, you're just selecting uh, uh, local, that's local one minimum. That's one, that's, that's one analytic for, uh, yeah, local minimums, and that's one analy analytic for memory leaks, right? Mm -hmm. So the other analytic is like for uh, uh, memory criti uh, criticality, right? And, and, and you can see there, there is a frequency change and a transitional change, right, uh, of a ratio change of uh, young generational collections to full GCs. Mm -hmm. And that ratio changes as you start struggling for memory. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's also another consequence of uh, of the struggle for memory is this thing here. You mean frequent full GCs? Frequent full GCs, uh, frequent long running full GCs will cause the JVM to shrink heat. Right. Which is counterintuitive, and it, it actually points out a bug in the. Uh, in, in, in the actual uh, adaptive sizing uh, policies inside the JVM as it, as it exists now. Um, but uh, <coughs> but uh, as you can see that, you know, visually there's a whole bunch of clear trends now and we're just going to use different, uh, you know, uh, type of uh, analytics, trend analytics or, or, and, or machine learning and or machine learning, I say too. Basically, uh, do that type of analysis, analysis on that, right? So that so in this case the GC events that we'd be looking for, right? We we take just have a filter that would like take those events and feed it into the machinery, and, and then end up doing the analytic after that. So that's where we want to head to after we deal with the <coughs> finish dealing with the messiness of the uh, uh, of the garbage collection logs, and that's another reason why I wanted to go reactive, right? Because now we can push these things to live stream. Uh, the reactive uh, much, is much better at supporting that type of uh, architecture and those types of design decisions than, 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 than how one would traditional program. Um, when you talk about back to reactive paradigm, you have multiple uh, readers of that process, you have ch individual checks on data, mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, you have multiple threads that process, you know, some some what aggregated data. Uh, what is the? I, I assume there is some sort of a, a task dis dispatcher. Is that a single thread thing or not? Well, uh, I mean, actor, act, you know, the act. Uh, sorry, ACTA is like a task dispatcher, right? Netty is the same type of thing, right? Our, you know, RX Java um, it sort of works differently in that way, but it's it's more like a a way of taking streams and doing transformations across streams and, and, and stuff like that, but um, that's um, yeah, that's essentially what's going on. So now. that's kind of a bottleneck. Yeah, which everything dis goes dis yeah, di disruptor is is like that also, right? So how reactive can be tolerant against the failure on, on, on that single point of entry? Well, in this case, what I did was I set guards up. That's why I use guard threats. Mm -hmm. So the guard threads actually do the pushing. So if some, so if I publish now, we want to publish that API, mm -hmm. so that people can write their own filters and stuff like that for data coming off the collectors, right? So if you do something stupid in your filter and kill a guard thread, you're not, you're not going to take down the pump, mm -hmm. right? You can kill the you can kill the thread, but it's not. <coughs> you know the the rest of the system should be resilient. Now if something but happens, but the but single. the pump itself, if something happens to it. Yeah, then then the guard threads will run by themselves. Yeah. And how is the, the objective to then expose these events uh, over the next steps? Uh, no, no, they're just in an API. 
as an internal API, not a in, in, API. in internal API, which we'll publish and just say, look, if you, um, um, so we're, you know, part of it will be redesigning how we do plugins and stuff like that. So basically you can say, here is this that implements this particular interface and it will register it onto the, onto the pump. But let's say you would, you would want to, in fact, uh, uh, perform analytics in the file uh, on the events that are produced from a network of machines, say hundreds of servers, then you would have to have uh, your own component interfacing or implementing some interfaces, calling an API, and then publishing yeah, it. Uh, so it's, yeah, so that's another piece of work that we just simply haven't had time to get to yet, but it's, it's certainly in the pipeline uh, because there is demand for it. There's people who actually do want that. Um, and uh, so that's just taking uh, live streaming uh, these, this type of information off of the JVM. Um, we can get the information off a Java Lang instrument like we did with the memory pool view thing. Um, and, and that's generally good enough to do some like what I call low, you know, low grade analytics and stuff like that. Certainly we could be predictive on critical memory conditions with that. You know, but, um, uh, for deeper analytics, you really, you know, this is the type of data that we'd really like to get to. The JVM currently doesn't have a way of exposing that to you very easily. Um, so we can, act, but we could expose it uh, via an agent with a JMX being. Wouldn't that be an option? I mean, that's, uh, Sorry? Wouldn't that be an option then? Well, we can expose the GC log uh, by basically tailing it with, an, with a Java agent that we attach to a JVM. That's the easy way to do it. However, the other problem is that J JMX connector technology right now is RMI based and any client that's interested in this um, is um, the problems they have in their production systems if they're running like a thousand JVMs, they don't want to poke holes for, uh, for RMI right, for configurations. Uh, but we have solutions for that also because uh, you can go, uh, the JMX connector technology, uh, you know, the Juluka guys in, in uh, Munich have implemented the JMX connector as a uh, RESTful service. Yeah. Okay. And so we can basically stream the data using uh, Joe uh, jo Kia, um, right, as a uh, RESTful service uh, data back into the, uh, you know, the analytic engine, which will then just take the data and, and, and work on it that way. So, yeah, it's, there's, yeah, it's just simply, um, um, you know, the, the problem, I mean, my biggest problem is, and one day I did sort of get really upset, was uh, with just Oracle uh, continuing to make uh, arbitrary, unannounced uh, changes to the log format, which means that... No you know, comment. Yeah, yeah, you know, no comment from Steve over here. Um, and we, you know, and, and their argument was that, well, we have to be able to make change to the log to add value information. My argument back was that, then, yes, add value information. Um, stop just making trivial arbitrary changes where we have to continually keep going and adjusting parsers and, 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 and things like that. So, so why don't you try to push uh, some sort of a, a jet over the log format for, for various episodes? That's of actually a, a great idea. We've been talking about um, standardizing the log formats um, or making it like, easier to parse, machine parsable. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, quite frankly, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of doing it that way, but that's probably something that we should do. So the, right now, right the, now it's, it's indeed it's sort of a dinosaur that grows its own way. So developer, yeah. you know, developer, whoever is in, 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 the, in the hotspot team, they thinks, oh, this, this law can be helpful, and I can even add the switch. So it's switchable, you can turn on and off. Well, and, 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 and here's, here's the problem. I mean, the, the jet for the logging framework uh, within the uh, open JD, within the JD, JVM, it sort of interfered with anybody wanting to do anything with the GC log formats themselves. It's sort of that JEP has sort of parallel, par, uh, you know, uh, um, paralyzed any other logging work that's going on. Well, you will and, need and the you unfortunate thing format, is that the, the the logging form the 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 JEP specifies uh, like a quote unquote log for J or JDK logging style logging framework inside the JVM, and we've really been fighting against that because that's an extremely brain dead expensive way to actually log right if you've ever if you went out and looked at what uh, Peter Lowry's done with the Java Chronicle the J Chronicle um, you know they had a session here um, and he has a very intelligent sensible way to log at millions of messages per second 
and uh, we were actually fighting for them to change the specification um, so that it would be um, less restrictive so that they could actually take on uh, like a J Chronicle uh, style logging framework, right? Um, other than that, you know, but unfortunately the, 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 the people who have been doing the work um, don't... Um, did we lose the live stream? Good. No, okay. we, we didn't lose the live stream. Your laptop yeah, went to the, sleep. Uh, the, oh, did it? Just oh. Okay. Uh, uh, Sorry. Anyway. The, so the, so so we're out of time. No. Okay. So the, just just to say that the, that the, the people who had written the JIT uh, uh, really, I don't think, had put an appropriate, you know, with, I mean, with all respect to how busy they are and everything, they hadn't put an, an appropriate level of thought into what they're doing. And they just copied something that was already there even though we know that that is a huge performance headache in a significant number of production systems that we that we visit, so um, you know, so we were we were actually hoping for something uh, better and more flexible. And the problem now is that all of the GC uh, logging uh, flags, where when you set it, you knew what you were getting, they're now being migrate it down into from what I would call like this digital logging format into this higher archical logic for, uh, logging format, right? Like a debug fine or whatever. And it's it doesn't map in that direction. It maps, you can map hierarchical into digital, but you cannot map digital into hierarchical <coughs> systems, mm -hmm. right? So they're making it more restrictive, which means that when you start turning certain flights on, you get a whole bunch of stuff being turned on that you didn't expect. Right. And also, and also, and and also like wants that. to penalize that standard. The semantic of the same GC event might be somewhat different on different VM implementations. Like it, like, uh, I'm the saying on J9, <coughs> it can it can same name event, you know, GC pops, let's say, right. and can mean uh, different things on, on different VMs. Yeah, th that's okay because we also have analytics that go through the log files, and uh, we, we can fairly accurately predict which version of the JVM you're using. As well you as don't which, need to predict that. Flags. You can read that uh, probably. What's that? You, you don't need to predict it. You can know this for sure. Which uh, and VM you're right, you you can't. <laughs> <laughs> if you if I get a GC log from some random customer, some random place, right? That people send them to me. Sometimes you get that information in the header. Sometimes you don't. So right now, I don't. Uh, the parsers don't rely on it. Because that we're. Well, that shouldn't be the way. I mean, that, that should that should be a known thing. That should not be a a, a guessable thing. Well. Like I said, the, the newer versions of the GC logs will put that in the header. If you happen to get the header, you're good. Yeah, huh? that page has to run on the right? piece of so, data. Right, uh, but, but you know, basically, you know, what, you know, like I said, if we go back to this thing here, you know, what version of the JVM is this running this? You know, what were the collectors, what were the flags that were set and stuff like that, right? Um, uh, that's, oh, you can't see that anymore. Steve? Yeah, but we okay. know what. But, uh, but, you know, you, it just starts logging. It doesn't give you any of the flags, right? But, uh, but uh, Red Hat put some stuff in now so you do get the flags, mm -hmm. right? So, but sometimes you get them because they're cut out. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you don't get them because they're cut out and stuff like that. So, so but anyway, so there's so many variations in the, in, in, in features in the log file. You can actually go through them and, and identify the version of the JVM that's being used just by looking at the features that are shown up. In the, in the log file, or even sometimes the bugs, all right? So you'll see a bug in one particular version that you won't see before or after, and so we, if we see that, then we know, okay, no problem, you have this, and then we can uh, adjust the semantics based on that. So, yeah, it's a waste of time. <laughs> Something really useful to know, I guess, yeah, okay. Anyways, um, yeah, sorry, it digressed in this direction. Uh, I think it's about, yeah, all right, so about things. Very interesting. I think we're, are we done? Are we out of yeah. time? Yeah. We're out of time. Okay. Lunch. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.